Hello and welcome to the program Sula's Big Adventures with me Sula. Today I'm coming to you from my driveway at my home in Montana where I have an expansive view to the south. The south is where we find the ecliptic, the apparent path of the sun, the moon, and the planets. And because of that, I'm able to watch the changing location of the setting sun throughout the seasons. On June 20th, the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, the sun will set as far north as it will all year long. And for me, that means between those two trees over there. And the next day, it will start its journey southward and it will start setting more and more southward all the way to the winter solstice, December 20th, when it will set as far south as it will all year long over Chimney Rock over there. Why is that? Well, the Earth orbits the Sun about once every 365 days or so, but the Earth is tilted 23 degrees to the plane of that orbit. So that half of the year, the northern hemisphere is more pointed to the sun, and the other half of the year, the southern hemisphere is more pointed to the sun. So when the northern hemisphere is more pointed to the sun, we get summer, we get longer days, we get warmer days, and the sun is very high in the sky. And then the opposite is true of the southern hemisphere. So the solstices mark the changing of the seasons. And because of that, the solstices have been very important to humans throughout human history. And in fact, you can find monuments to the solstices all over the world. But probably the most famous ancient monument in the world is Stonehenge. <laughs> I can't get this rock to budge. Can you imagine dragging a rock for miles? Well, that's what they did at Stonehenge. I visited Stonehenge recently. Stonehenge is located on the Salisbury Plain in South Central England, about an hour or two from London or from the nearby town of Bath, which is beautiful. We took a train from London to spend a few days in Bath, and from Bath we took a 45-minute bus ride to the monument. Stonehenge was built by Neolithic farmers in stages over a long period of time, probably beginning about 3000 BC, but long before the construction of Stonehenge, Neolithic people began settling in this area of England, as evidenced by a large settlement uncovered at Durrington Walls, which is about two miles away, and that dates back about 8,000 BC. The original inhabitants of the area were hunter-gatherers hunting a type of wild cattle, now extinct, called oryx, and later they took up agriculture. At this time, most of England was forested, while the Salisbury Plain was mostly open on account of the chalk in the soil. And this might explain why this area was deemed suitable for a monument. In addition to the settlement at Durrington Walls, there are other structures in the surrounding area that date back much farther than the construction of Stonehenge, such as the Barrow Pits, which are burial grounds. The main structure of Stonehenge began as a ditch dug out with simple tools made from antlers of red deer with the chalk piled up to make an inner and an outer bank. The ditch has a 180 foot radius and it has two openings, one to the northeast and another to the south. The opening to the northeast goes all the way to the River Avon. Many antlers have been recovered from excavations of the ditch, confirming the use of the antlers as tools. Within the bank and the ditch were possibly some timber structures, and set just inside the bank were 56 pits known as the Aubrey holes. These holes may have held upright timber posts and possibly some of them may have had stone. Within and around the Aubrey holes and the ditch are about 64 cremations that they've found, and perhaps as many as 150 individuals were originally buried at Stonehenge. Inside Stonehenge, archaeologists have found cremation remains forming a huge Neolithic burial ground, and indeed, the larger area surrounding Stonehenge is filled with other monuments that are dominated by burial mounds and a variety of other circles or hinges throughout this area. About 2500 BC, 
Stones were set up in the center of the monument. Two types of stones were used at Stonehenge. The larger rocks are sarsens, a type of sandstone rock, and the smaller blue stones. The sarsens were erected in two concentric arrangements, an inner horseshoe and an outer circle. And the blue stones were set up between them in a double arc. Just outside of the ditch is the famous heel stone, which marks the rising sun on the morning of the summer solstice and also the setting sun on the winter solstice. Inside the ditch is a central set of stones called trilithons, consisting of five pairs of stones, each about 24 feet tall and weighing about 40 tons each. The stones were pounded into rectangular shapes and the pairs of stones are topped by a vertical stone called a lintel that's held in place by mortise and tenon joints fitted onto a peg atop the vertical stones. These stones were probably dragged to Stonehenge from Marlborough Downs about 18 miles away. <clears throat> the trilithons are surrounded by a circle of stones that was probably originally 30 stones, but some have fallen down or been taken away. On the inside of this are smaller blue stones that were probably brought to Stonehenge from 150 miles away in Wales. Although most people know Stonehenge as a place marking the summer solstice, it's also a place marking the winter solstice sunset. Pig bones found at Stonehenge indicate that it was also the site of yearly festivals around the winter solstice and that the pigs were not local pigs, indicating that the monument was known to many other people who came from afar to either bury their dead or partake in the festivals. Footnote, some people such as Gerald Hawkins believe that the station stone at Stonehenge marks the southernmost moonrise of the major lunar standstill, which is the 18.6 year cycle of the moon, which is about to occur as I film this, but this theory has been criticized and according to Dr. Bradley Schaefer, Stonehenge is not a place marking the major lunar standstill. He believes this for a number of reasons, but primarily he believes it because unlike the solstices, which mark the changing of the seasons and help those people keep their calendars, the major lunar standstill doesn't have any impact on our daily lives and it lasts too long to keep a calendar based on it, and it doesn't affect the agriculture calendar keeping. So I'll let you decide for yourself because there are two ancient markers of the major lunar standstill, supposedly, at Chaco Culture and at Chimney Rock National Monument, both in the United States. At Stonehenge, there's a wonderful museum near the monument with relics found at the site and exhibits demonstrating how the Neolithic people dragged and then raised these enormous stones. The day I visited was close to, but not exactly the summer solstice, but I was content just imagining the sun rising and setting instead of actually attending on the summer solstice with throngs of people. However, I was disappointed that you're not allowed to get anywhere close to the stone circle. Oh well, it was magical just visiting and imagining these ancient people constructing Stonehenge, dragging enormous stones for miles and then erecting them, cremating and burying their dead there and holding festivals at Stonehenge to mark the summer and the winter solstices. Stonehenge is not at all a serene place unless you're Albert Lynn of National Geographic and you get special permission to visit Stonehenge all by yourself. Normally, there are throngs of tour buses and private cars arriving continuously throughout the day, filling an enormous parking lot. And there are also hundreds of people around the monument of course, trying to get pictures of themselves in front of it. 
which is in stark contrast to the other famous ancient marker of the summer solstice that I've visited at Chaco Culture National Historical Park, which is in the United States in the state of New Mexico. And it's fabulous, by the way, but it's visited by very few people and it's both peaceful and serene. Nevertheless, Stonehenge is a thought-provoking place. You can almost feel the presence of these ancient people and it makes you ponder why was marking the summer solstice and the winter solstice so important to these people to the point that they would drag 40 ton rocks for miles and miles. Well, the solstices were incredibly important to ancient cultures, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, because they marked the changing of the seasons and that had an impact on the agriculture they were practicing, but it was also important for calendar keeping and for festivals. I'm glad I finally got to visit Stonehenge. I recommend you visit it too, if you're ever in England, in London or Bath. That's it for now. I'll see y'all soon. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off.